Hi, I'm Chris Walker with Rio Products, and thanks for tuning in to another episode of our how-to series. In today's episode, we're gonna be talking about how to approach one of the most underrated hatches in fly fishing, which is midges. And midges, I think, are underrated because they're available in just about every trout fishery in the world. And under the right circumstances, trout really do key in on these bugs. I think a lot of people overlook this hatch because the flies are very small. As you can see, typical flies are maybe a size 20, could be as small as a size 26 or 28 in certain instances. Um, but that shouldn't scare you away from fishing this hatch because it can produce great results in the coldest months of the year. So in order to understand this hatch and have success on it, first we have to go over a little bit of the life cycle of midges. So they start as an egg, and the eggs are typically in the substrate of the bottom and unavailable to trout, so not very important to anglers. The next life stage is the larva, and those are also in the substrate, but they get dislodged by currents and they move around enough that they are available to trout and they can produce some really good fishing. So small flies that are sort of worm-like and sparsely tied are the ones that are going to get the most attention as a larva imitation. And I like to fish these close to the bottom, usually under a strike indicator, just because that's where most of the food is present. Next after larva, the midge become pupa. And the pupa looks very similar to the larva. There are some visual distinctions, but really the same set of flies can kind of stand in for both. But what differentiates the pupa more than appearance, in my opinion, is their behavior. They actually ascend through the water column to the surface of the river or the lake. And therefore, uh, they're very, very available to trout. Lots of trout will feed on those types of bugs when they're hatching. So these flies here that are a little bit larger, a little bit flashier, those are gonna be better imitations of the midge pupa. And last but certainly not least is the midge adult. And that's my favorite life stage because it produces really, really good dry fly fishing, sometimes in the middle of the winter. So just like a mayfly, uh, the pupa ascend to the surface, the adult cracks out of the exoskeleton, and they'll float along for a while while their wings dry before they're able to take off. And that's when flies like these, uh, midge dry flies, can really become important. And they come in a different, couple of different styles. Some are very small, and those are good for imitating um, single adults on the surface, which can be a very important source of food for trout. Others are a little bit bigger and bushier, and those are great for imitating clusters of midges. When midges hatch very profusely, you can actually end up with big enough clusters that the trout key in on a little bit larger profile. So that's a quick rundown of the midge life cycle. And next, it's really important to understand when midges hatch and when you're most likely to encounter the best action on the water. So time of year is very important. As I said, this hatch occurs in the colder months of the year, typically. Um, it's the last hatch I fish in the fall, and it's the first hatch I fish in the spring, and I don't really stop fishing them in between. Uh, you can have really great dry fly days even in the middle of the winter, January or February. The days you pick to fish are important as well. Uh, in those colder months of the year, you're gonna see more hatches, more bugs hatching when the water's a little bit warmer and when you get a slightly warmer day. So if I had to pick between a 40 degree day and a 25 degree day, it's a happy coincidence that more bugs are gonna be out when it's 40 because that's more comfortable to fish in anyway. And lastly, weather is important too. So I prefer cloudy days. If fish are gonna be rising, uh, they'll do it you know, more frequently on a cloudy day just because they're not as worried about being spotted from above and they're just generally more comfortable eating off the surface under darker skies. So today we're out on the river. It's uh, sort of late winter. We've got a nice warm day. Unfortunately, we've got very sunny skies at the moment, but I think we'll still be able to find some rising fish if we look hard enough. So let's take a look. So now the weather's on our side. We've got some clouds overhead and the midges are hatching in greater numbers. And because it's cloudy, those fish are really not as afraid of the surface. They're happy to eat them uh, on top. So we've actually got some rising fish behind me here and they're in what's called winter water. And winter water is simply slower, deeper water and trout tend to seek that out in the colder months of the year because they're cold blooded and they get more lethargic when those water temperatures drop. Uh, because they're more lethargic, they'll sit in spots like this where they don't have to work so hard to maintain position in the current and they can seek out food without expending as much energy. So now that the fish are rising, uh, I can target them with a dry fly. And for flies, I've got a small midge pattern here. This is Rio's caviar midge. Uh, it's about a size 20. And it's a very subtle pattern, 
that is hard to see on the water, frankly. So above that, about 18 inches up, I've tied a higher vis fly. This is a high vis parachute Adams. And I'll use this as my sighter on the water. So I'll cast both flies. Usually you can pick out that higher visibility fly right off the bat. And now I've got my small fly tied about 18 inches behind my larger fly. And hopefully when the larger fly hits the water, I'll be able to pick it up very easily. And then by just looking behind it, I can find my small dry fly as well to make sure it's going over the fish. For fly lines, uh, I'm using the Elite Technical Trout. And this is my favorite taper for this type of fishing because it delivers a fly very delicately. It's got a long, fine front taper, which is perfect when you're throwing small flies like these to picky fish. So let's see if we can catch one of these fish. So I'm casting at this angle because it's allowing me to put my flies just a little bit downstream of my fly line. And that way the fish will see the flies before they see any hint of fly line. Uh, I'm also looking kind of downstream here because I've got a better angle with the sun. Uh, there's sort of a darker background which is allowing me to see rising fish a little bit more consistently than if I was looking upstream with more glare. So there were a couple of fish rising in here. They've sort of slowed down, but I think they're still there. Because this water's moving so slowly and the hatch is still pretty sparse, the fish are actually moving around quite a bit. I'm noticing that fish will rise a little closer, then they'll move out and rise a little further away. And really what I'm trying to do now is just put my fly over where the fish was most recently. So dry fly fishing in the winter here, uh, it's definitely not as easy as it is in the summer. I found that the fish, because they're so lethargic and because the bugs are so small, they're really unwilling to move out of their way to eat something, especially an artificial fly. So one of the things you do is you make a lot of casts at the same fish just to be able to present it in exactly the right lane and hopefully show them exactly what they're looking for. And you don't always win. There he is. That one ate the big fly. Now we've got him on pretty light tippet here, so I gotta play him gently. Rainbow. Beautiful rainbow trout. And there he is in the net. So that's a gorgeous fish. He was feeding right in the winter water where we'd expect him. And I was fishing my two fly rig with a larger dry fly as a cider, and he actually ate the cider on that, uh, on that particular cast. So there he is, beautiful, healthy rainbow. So that fish ate the larger of the two flies, my parachute atoms here. That can be a really good imitation for a cluster of midges. So maybe that's what the fish took it for, or maybe he just wanted a bigger bite to eat. Uh, but it was actually pretty tough to get one of these fish to eat a dry fly. Uh, we've got the sun peeking out again, so fewer of them are rising. And I've noticed a lot of the fish that are breaking the surface are actually feeding just subsurface. They're not quite getting all the way uh, through the surface film. And that makes me think they might be keyed in on pupa. So the next technique I'm going to try is instead of using two dry flies, I'll use my large cider dry fly to suspend a small midge pupa uh, just subsurface. So we'll get that rigged up and see if we can catch a fish that way. So here's my little midge pupa. I'm gonna go with a classic pattern called a zebra midge. And you can see there's really not much to this fly at all. All it is is a, a silver bead and then a silver rib over a uh, black thread body. But that's actually a really great match for a midge pupa. Hopefully the fish like that a little better. So now that I've got my pupa rigged up, I'm actually using that cider dry fly uh, as a strike indicator. So if I see it bob or dip below the surface, I'll know a fish has taken that small pupa that's just below it. And hopefully this technique gets them. Yep, there he is. Oh, oh he let go. So there was a take. That fish was all over that pupa. After about 100 drifts with a dry fly, uh, really hard to get one to rise, but you know, first run through there with something just subsurface and that fish was happy to eat it. Hopefully that means we'll get them the next time. Yep, fish on. That one ate the pupa really nicely. 
So that's just a great, uh, great reminder that you may want to get them on the dry fly, but it might not always be feasible. And by changing your technique just a little bit, you can have a much greater rate of success. That was two eats on the pupa and three casts, as opposed to one good eat on a dry fly and about a hundred. And there he is. Oh no. <laughs> There's that fish. Beautiful Yellowstone cutthroat trout. All right, so there's a pretty little cutthroat. That one ate my, uh, my midge pupa suspended just below that cider dry fly. Uh, you can see he's a nice healthy fish getting ready for the spawn in just a couple weeks here. So just to review, we've showed you two different techniques for catching fish on midge hatches in the colder months of the year. Uh, the first were dry flies. It took us quite a few attempts, but we did get one on top. Uh, and the second was a midge pupa suspended below a dry fly which turned out to be much more effective in this spot here. Uh, again, it's really important to target the winter water, which are the slower stretches. That's where you'll find the most feeding fish when the midges are hatching. And hopefully you've learned something in this episode that you can take back and apply your local water to get you on more fish during midge hatches throughout the year. Thanks for watching this episode of our how-to series. And if you liked what you saw, you can check the rest out online at realproducts.com.